Good morning. What a great day to be in worship together today. So if you've looked at your bulletin, as some of you had and said, it looks like things are missing. Uh, it is Take a Chance Sunday. So you will remember if you've been here for the past couple of weeks that throughout August we've invited you to submit your favorite hymns that you would like to be singing during worship. And so those are going to be drawn out during the worship service. As we get ready to sing those hymns, we'll, uh, intern Rachel will just come to, your, uh, to somebody and pull one out. Now, this does mean we've been asking you to submit your favorite. So she comes to you and says, draw a hymn out. That does not mean take the basket and rifle through and find yours. And you are just taking one out at random for all of us to sing, just so you're, you know how that's going to work this morning. And, uh, and, and I'll explain what's happening with the scripture readings and the sermon as we get a little bit closer to that in the midst of our worship life this morning. Just, just one note, uh, and actually if I see a whole bunch of people on a Labor Day weekend come in a little, little later, I'll probably announce it again. But the Lord's Prayer that we're using this morning that's on page 3, I'm just pointing it out to you so when we get to our communion liturgy and we're a part of the Lord's Prayer, we're going to use the ecumenical version of the Lord's Prayer. This is a version that's used throughout Lutheran and Episcopal and Methodist and Presbyterian churches that all of those churches went together to find a common language Lord's Prayer. And so we're going to use that as part of our worship life this morning. And it is printed for you in your worship bulletin. So I'm Pastor Gary Sandberg and privileged to serve here with Pastor Brigitte Weir. Pastor Brigitte is uh, enjoying time with family and a family vacation this weekend and intern Rachel Patterson. And if you've had not had a chance to meet intern Rachel yet, please take time in between services out in the courtyard and, and around. We'll be here and would be delighted to have you have a chance to get acquainted. During the worship service as we sing, uh, we'll probably remember at times to ask you to stand and sit, but to be honest, some of this is new for us, so we're kind of going with it as we go. I would say just go with it, have a time of worship. If it looks like everybody around you seems to be standing and you would like to, go ahead and stand with them. Uh, that would be a beautiful thing. But at any time in worship, if, if we are standing, but you know it's more appropriate or more comfortable for you to remain seated, Please absolutely feel free to remain seated during those parts of our worship life this morning. And as this is Labor Day weekend, you'll notice uh, during communion, uh, again, it's in your bulletin and I'll draw your attention to it again, but we are going to have the blessing of the hands or anointing of hands for Labor Day this weekend as well. So after receiving communion, there'll be um, people at either end of the communion rail, a couple of sets where you can go and have your hands blessed as we all know that uh, labor in the name of our Lord is so vitally important for all of us. So I think that's everything we need to know for Take a Chance Sunday. So intern Rachel at this time is going to come out to four different people and we're going to find out what we're going to do and how we're going to get started with our uh, singing of hymns this morning. One of the things I should note, and you're like, what's she doing? It's taking a long time. We're going to sing a lot of times just the first verse, so we get to sing a lot of hymns. So that's a part of what we're going to do, is give you the chance to do a lot of singing. And if it turns out, if we pull Beautiful Savior out like six times, we're probably just going to sing it once, and we'll go on to some other things too. Okay, so our gathering hymns are... Uh, number 689, Praise and Thanksgiving. So we're going to do the first verse of that. And we will invite you to stand. Hymn 689, which are in the back of the large red worship book that you have in the pew racks in front of you.
first of is Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, number 413. Number 413. I love to tell the story. Number 661.
Let us pray. O oh God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside, and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. So at this time, uh, some of you are going to help choose what our readings are, well, sort of. So throughout this past 10 days or ago, all of the staff here at Bethany have been invited to put in some scripture passages into a couple of baskets. I don't know what's in here. So they've simply put scripture passages in here that they would like to possibly hear preached from this morning. So I'm going to have an Old Testament passage drawn out and I will read it. And then one of our New Testament letters or epistles drawn out and then a gospel drawn out. And then I'll have to preach a sermon weaving all three together. Uh, and we'll see what happens here in a couple of minutes. So we'll have here, will you pull out our Old Testament reading for us? Okay, and I'll take that. Here, I'll, I'll open it so you know that, that that's actually the one that was actually there. That so is the 11, 1 to 4. Okay. thing is not having a mark ahead of time. Here we go. So this is from uh, the prophet Hosea, and we're going to read from Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And I don't know what page that is in the passage in front of us. If somebody, because I'm using my 938. 938. So if you'd like to follow along in the, in the Bibles in the pew racks in front of you, it's page 938 in the front portion, the Old Testament portion of that. So this is Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And God, speaking through Hosea, says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come over here. Are you drawing up? I'm going to open this in front of you so you know I'm not cheating and picking a different one when I get up front. So you'll see that's first Timothy. Okay. Our second reading is from 1 Timothy. This is again in the back portion now, the New Testament portion of the Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 224. And it's page 224. So 1 first, first Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. This is Paul speaking to the church in Thessalonica, by the way. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman, woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, 
but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. Thank you, whoever did that. <laughs> And our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. And it's verse, just one verse, 25. So Matthew 24, page 27, page 27 in the New Testament. And this is under the, uh, under the title where uh, Jesus is talking about the coming of the Son, the Son of Man. So Matthew 24, verse 29 says, Immediately after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. So we hear this prophet Hosea coming to the people. These are words of such comfort to people who find themselves in in exile. People who who are away, who feel like they have been cast out. And Hosea comes to them and, and Hosea is filled with imagery along the way in all of his life. And then this imagery again of God coming the way you would come to a child. You, you gotta love that kind of imagery of God saying to them in the midst of so many ways that it feels like they've almost been discarded, that Hosea comes and talks to them the way that sometimes children feel, as if they don't have a voice somewhere and at times. And Hosea comes and reminds them, you always have a voice. You always have a way of knowing how important you are to me. And so, talks about reminding them that I actually bent down to you. And then this would be kind of remarkable when you would think about it, because to be a very proper person, you would always want to stand upright. And so children may come to you, of course, but they should have their place. They should be down low and and below you. But as a proper person, you're really going to have that kind of authority. And in the midst of that, God says, I was the one who bent down to you. I came down to your level so you would know how important you are to me and, and how, much we, how much we desire to be together and to remind you that you are absolutely not forgotten. In fact, in some ways, you could think about standing and talking to your peers could almost sometimes be off-putting. You know, you you both kind of have this air about each other. But when you go to speak to a child, everything about that goes away. And all that's left is just this personal, intimate relationship that can happen when you have a, a conversation out of love that you might share with one another. And so when we hear Hosea do that, and I want to remind myself, even as you might, of some of that imagery that they have, when he talks about when Israel was a child, I loved him. And then that great prophecy, even when we think about this, he's saying, I called him out of Egypt. And so we get that sense that in the Old Testament, we'll hear that and realize that the people had been slaves in Egypt and God remembered them. We even hear, if we go back to Exodus, it says the people were in labor, or I mean, in hard labor, not a, you know something to think about for Labor Day weekend, I guess. You know, the people there were, were in hard labor throughout all that time, largely feeling completely forgotten until it says that you know, Moses had left and he'd gone on and meets God at the burning bush, and it says, and God remembered the suffering of God's own people. 
as if you sort of wonder what happened for three or four hundred years that God wasn't in tune with that suffering, but it was that sense of being, uh, of being brought into the fact that God all of a sudden says, you have my full attention. And maybe that's a part of this too, is understanding when I bend down. And so when I called you out of Egypt, we get that imagery of being called out of slavery. But then as we think about this later on and we hear these prophecies unfold, maybe it comes in the same way we hear that prophecy from Matthew, which sounds really rather dramatic when we talk about the sun being darkened and it sounds like a very a scary day that, that is going to happen. But we remember all of those prophecies that come, including the fact that once again, someone is called out of Egypt. And so we have to go back into that story of remembering uh, from Luke where Herod had sent his soldiers out to kill the young babies. And so Mary and Joseph had to flee with the baby Jesus to keep him safe. And where did they flee to? Egypt. Yes, they flew to they fled to Egypt and so again we see once again through that prophet that we hear these words out of Egypt I have called you and people in Jesus day would now say ah there's some more ways that that prophecy is coming together we might then hear the same thing from that that verse of Matthew as we hear Jesus talking about the coming of the Son of Man and we conjure back to that very sense of the Old Testament when it would seem like the power of God was always appearing on a mountain. You know, smoke and fire were the ways that we would understand that kind of presence. And so Jesus wants people to know it's that same kind of awe and power of God that we continue to revel in. And we almost don't just we don't revel in it, but we, we expect it. We expect the, the awesome power of God to be made known in so many ways and through, through nature and through all of that that comes. And sometimes that will happen when we realize that we just have to sit back and, and let it happen. The one thing about signs is the harder you try to make a sign, the probably the, the more fleeting it will be from you. But at times when you just sit back and let it come, all of a sudden you realize, Things are happening around me that, that I can't explain in, in any perfect way. How many of you last Sunday morning, like I did, woke up and were driving to church or maybe you already had a vacation planned or you were heading somewhere and for like, what has it been? Like 18 days, it seemed like we've gone without seeing the mountains because of all of the, the haze that had been out there. And then last Sunday morning, as I'm driving in to church, and I'm sure some of you experienced this, it was all of a sudden, oh, the mountains are back, you know? And it's almost like, it's almost like we thought they left, you know, practically because they had just been unseen and they were there in such glory. And part of it is you go to bed uh, on a Saturday after you've been dealing with all of this haze and you don't expect anything. And then when it just happens to you and you just see that glory unfold, especially if you were up early and you caught the way the sun was hitting them and it had that sort of purplish glow to the mountains that's just so majestic. I think that's what Jesus is even trying to let us know in these kinds of prophecies is that sometimes you're just going to see it. It's just going to overcome you and something's going to be different in your spirit. It certainly was for me just seeing that again. And I'm relatively new to Denver. I mean, some of you who've been here for 40 years, you must be thinking, oh, pastor, you got no idea. You know, we, we live, we live for those kind of experiences here in Denver. And I would say those are the kinds of experiences we, we just we can't wait to live for again and again, the way that they continue to come over us. And so when we hear those words of prophecy, we hear Jesus trying to once again talk to us about these words of prophecy. They call us into a new way of living, a new way of thinking, just a new way of saying, I want to be a part of something grand. And so when we think about that, and then we have this, this portion of Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, where uh, he's, he's coming and talking to things that were very real about the culture in that day. Clearly on Paul's day, there was a, a real duality to society. There were the learned men, and there were women who were servants. And that was very much a part of the world that Paul had grown up in. 
and to understand what that would mean. So for Paul, as he's trying to start this new church and he's trying to get things going, clearly he had to have felt some kind of conflict in his spirit about all of this, about saying, how do I lift up the gifts that everybody has? But we have to admit, Paul would not have known about a, a, a culture in 2018 where we understand the, the gifts and the, 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 um, the way that people have talents to bring them even to the church that I'm sure even Paul would probably look, be looking down from heaven and go, yeah, I kind of missed that one. Sorry about that, you know? But all I can tell you is I knew what I knew at the time. I knew at the time that this church needed to see itself unveiled. This church needed to see God's power coming in a new way because they had so much going against them. I mean, their leader had been crucified and risen from the dead, but that's not the easiest thing to explain. And then you have all of this, and, and, and you have this culture gap that you're dealing with. And so Paul comes out, and he, and he says, look, if this is going to get started, we're going to have to let people get comfortable with this. So, so men, you're going to have to get this going. And sometimes women, that means you're going to have to be silent because if we upend everything, nothing's going to work well. Everybody's going to look and say, are there no rules anymore whatsoever? Does nothing have any importance whatsoever? And we might think when we hear these words that Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, well, that would never be us because we are, are, are so progressive and we're so advanced and we would never try to make women seem lesser of themselves. And, and yet we realize even for ourselves that change does become challenging at times. I mean, we look at our own lives and we would like to say, well, we're, we're, we're just going to always know what should be and, and always be on the, the cutting edge, the, the moving edge of things. And there are very few times that the church is ever, uh, um, ever considered being on the, the cutting edge or the moving edge of things. You know, the, the church has become such a great follower over the years of so many things that maybe at times we have to realize something in our own heritage sometimes calls that out in ourselves. So maybe there are even new signs around us that we have to take take advantage of at times, that we have to consider at times we are being called into a new way of thinking. It's a way of thinking that would say, if you are in authority, you have to think about those who are not in authority. And how are we called to care for them the best? The same way we would hear Hosea say, we come and bend down to lift children up. That out of a place like, uh, uh, like Egypt, we would call people into God's kingdom. How do, we, how do we go about understanding that the signs that are around us probably most days are a little more subtle than mountains that are smoking and quaking uh, with the very presence of God to them. But signs are there nonetheless, and so we have to understand what that means for us. And sometimes for the church, the signs are, are, are quite dramatic and we still say, but we don't have to do that because we're the church and we, we own the truth. And so we don't have to be swayed by what's happening out in the world. And sometimes people would say, well, you're not swayed by what's happening out in the world. And, and then you don't have any relevance to what's happening out in the world. So sometimes we have to say we got to get involved in what's happening in the world. We have to be people who say, when things are happening around us, that's where the church needs to be, not insulating ourselves from the challenges that come to us, but diving full in and saying, where is the church's call in the midst of all of this? And, and I'm blessed to serve in a church where we realize the church's call into this great society is to lift women up is to look at the gifts that everybody has to share, that bends down and tells children how important they are to the entire life of our, of our community. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of place in the church that we need to be. And sometimes what it means is just have your eyes open. Who out there feels like they still don't have a place? They're, they're waiting for a sign. And they're thinking it's going to be as dramatic as, as a mountain quaking, as, as Mount St. Helens erupting. And people can say, there, God's telling you, church, get moving. 
but it seems like those kind of dramatic signs are slow in coming. Maybe we need to be the church that gives a dramatic sign to the world, that looks at the, those who might be labeled in this day the least among us and bend down and pick them up. To those times when it would seem as if, as if nothing's changing, to say to them, you know, in my spirit, I'm becoming closer to God. And when that happens, I become closer to you. And that we are those people who are willing to admit church doesn't always get it right. Even, even Paul didn't get that one right. For the day, he would probably say, it needed to be that way for that day. But thank goodness we have a church who does not say we will be stuck there. But we have a church who can look to the future and say God is calling us to something bigger, something grander than we might even know ourselves. Maybe we'll find a sign, like a Sunday morning when the mountains seem to appear out of a haze. And maybe sometimes we'll just look around. We'll see that one person who feels like they've been told that they really don't belong and we will bend down and we will honor them. We'll come to their very level and say here, in you and in me, and more importantly, when we are together, that's where the church lives. Someone may not need to see the mountains. They might just need to see you. They might just need to see you bending down and saying to them, you are important to me. You are important to God. Now that's a sign. Amen. And now if you will, in, in your bulletin, um, it'll tell you that Rick, in listening to the sermon, has chosen the perfect hymn to edify that sermon. Okay, our hymn of the day is 438, and it does deal with prophecies and signs and features a line that we heard from the book of Hosea, uh, 438, my Lord, what a morning. Right. Let's stand and sing.
continue on with worship on page two with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with those who are around you. There is in your worship bulletin a welcome card that lets us know that we are in worship together today. We do invite you to fill that out. If you are new in worship here this morning, all we ask is that you let us know that you are in worship here. And uh, we invite you to simply place this in the offering plate and consider it your offering here this morning if you are new into worship here at Bethany Lutheran Church. There are, uh, you have a packed worship bulletin with ministry opportunities in it today. We invite you to take that home so that you can see so many of them. I want to highlight just a few of them for you this morning. The first one simply says September 9, but that's because there's like a thousand things happening next Sunday, and we couldn't possibly list them all. One thing to be aware, if you typically worship uh, later in on a Sunday morning, that next Sunday we move to our 2018-2019 schedule, which will have worship at 8.15, education at 9.30, and then worship at 10.30. We've been worshiping at 10.15 through this past year, and this next year, as we head into our program year, worship will be at 10.30, but this morning service still at 8.15. Also, you'll see later on in September, the beginning of some Sunday evening offerings of worship and fellowship, and want you to be aware of those. Next Sunday everything kind of kicks in. So there will be a breakfast sponsored by Operation One Nation. Our opening of Sunday School Carnival will be happening out in the courtyard. People can come to worship, go down and meet Sunday School teachers, and then come up and join in the courtyard, or just come in at 9.30, go down, meet Sunday School teachers, and then end up in the courtyard throughout the morning breakfast. uh, We invite you to come and be a part of that. So many things are happening with that next Sunday. We want you to to, to be here and and to be around and take it all in. And then coming up with that are also so many registrations that happen right, of course, at this time of the year. So uh, if you have students who are attending Sunday school classes, get involved in that. There are some adult classes that are being registered for now or will be in the very near future. So we want you to be really aware of them but all of that is a part of our ministries happening next Sunday. But if you're wondering, so what's today all about? Head out to the courtyard after worship. There is uh, snacks out there, of course, in the morning, as well as our Bethany Early Childhood Center has uh, the gift cards that they sell. That they sell. So basically, you buy a $100 uh, King Supers card, you go to King Supers, they give you $100 worth of groceries for that. I mean, you even get to choose your own groceries as, as a part of that, but you just, you just pay for that. But our Early Childhood Center gets 5% of that back. So it costs you nothing and gains them a lot. So we invite you to go out and they have all kinds of different sorts of gift cards out there. So please be aware of that as well as our um, uh, the global mission team selling the fair, fair trade coffees and chocolates. All of those kinds of things happening around even this morning. So please avail yourself of the wonderful ways that we are in ministry together. All of this happens because we are people who 
understand that we are people of a generous God. And when we respond in generosity, ministry just seems to come to life in all of these exciting ways that Bethany can be a part of that are supported. And so now, as an act of worship, our offering will be received. I invite you to stand. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and all your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. A word about Holy Communion here at Bethany Lutheran Church. The word is, you are invited. That's actually three words, but they are important. You are invited. All who are in worship here are invited to celebrate communion in this place. But please know, this is not an invitation from me. It is not an invitation even from Bethany Lutheran Church. It is an invitation from Jesus Christ. Jesus provides us with these gifts of bread and wine, his body and blood. It is by his invitation that you're invited to celebrate communion in this place. And today that would also mean to have your hands blessed as a sign of our Christian service on this Labor Day weekend. Our liturgy for communion you'll find at the bottom of page 2 in your worship bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Jesus met with his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem. They were there to share in the Passover celebration. But Jesus knew that this would be the last Passover that he would share with his disciples as this would become the night of his betrayal. And so it was in that meal that our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, at the top of page three, we join in the Lord's Prayer using the ecumenical version of the Lord's Prayer as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Note that during communion distribution, um, Rick will again be looking at some of the hymns that people have submitted over these past several weeks, and just letting you know, typically we'll sing just the first verse of those hymns that he'll announce as part of our communion music this morning. You'll be invited to come down. Um, there's instructions on page three of your worship bulletin as well. Note that the communion at the very center has gluten-free bread and alcohol-free wine. If that meets your dietary needs, please visit that station. Otherwise, the other stations have uh, bread and wine at them. After you receive communion, you're, you're invited to come to a spot at the communion rail where some of our Stevens ministers will be blessing your hands in a sign of the blessing of Christian labor on this day. All of these things, and for all of God's graces, you are all invited to share. Our first communion hymn, 793. Be thou my vision, verse 1, 793. Our second communion hymn, you may not have seen this coming, 838, Beautiful Savior. Our third communion hymn, 767, seven, Lord, take my hand. We'll sing the first two verses, 767. Seven.
I invite you to stand. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray together. Holy and ever-present God, we gather here in this place knowing full well that you are with us. We pray for the earth, watch over and protect endangered species, and help to heal the earth from the effects of fires and other devastation. Make us good stewards of creation. Guide all into lives of safety and care. We pray for all of those who are hard at work, that their lives may be supported by their labors, that they may be able to care for their families and find a sense of well-being. We ask you, O oh God, to comfort the sick, the grieving, the lonely, and the frightened, that they may know your presence with them always. Today, we name before you Bruce, Marga, Lowell, Jerry, Barbara, and Bill, Mary, David, Zachary, Dawn, and Phyllis. And we lift up to you all those we hold in our hearts, you, God, are a God of wonders, and we pray to see your wonderful work in our world today and all days. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the love of God fill up your hearts. May the joy of Christ fill up your souls. And may the Spirit of God send you forth in blessing, but not for you alone, but that you might look around to this world and know who else needs to see God's blessing, that you might be so blessed to reach down and offer them the love of God, knowing that you do so because you are blessed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we have a sending and a recessional hymn. We're going to sing... All verses, or uh, maybe the first verse of the sending. Okay, first verse of the sending, uh, or of the uh, the sending hymn, and then we'll sing more of the recessional hymn. So choose wisely. Okay. Thank you, thank you. All right, we have number four seventy nine. We come to the hungry feast. is number 779, Amazing Grace.
serve the Lord.